Hey everyone, welcome to this video and this is all about the Azure Load Balancer. This has been one of the most requested videos uh, I've had people asking for. So in this, I really want to go into some of the details around the functionality and how you're going to use it. Now, to get started with this, the whole reason we have a load balancer is I have certain instances of some resource and they're all offering the same thing. It might be offering a website, it might be offering some middle tier, it could be some back end system, but they're all doing the same thing. So maybe this is kind of IP1, IP2, and IP3. And the idea is there's some kind of traffic coming in. I have some client. Now that client could be internal, it's something on my internal network, or it could be public, it's something coming in from the internet. But regardless, I have these multiple instances for scale purposes, for resiliency purposes. But I don't want the client to have to worry about that. I want them to have kind of a, a single endpoint they can go to, and then that endpoint will distribute the traffic to whichever of those back end, so these are gonna make up a back end set of pool, that is available. And so the way we do that is we have kind of this load balancer construct. So in this case, the Azure load balancer. Now this is a layer four load balancer. And when I say layer four, this comes back to the kind of uh, OSI, the open systems interconnect. Um, when I was 18 and I started as a VAX VMS systems administrator, there was no IP we had the OSI model. And you can kind of think about, there's this saying kind of, um, please do not throw sausage pizza away. And it's around the different layers. So there's kind of the physical, the data link, the network, the transport, the session, the presentation, the application. So this is like the physical ethernet. This could be, for example, IP or ICMP. This could be TCP, UDP. Um, then we have things like up here, this could be SSL, and then HTTP, etc. So when I talk about something layer four, it understands this. It understands TCP, UDP. So when I think about, hey, the Azure load balancer, it's a layer four, so it understands TCP, UDP. It has no concept of HTTP. It can't do anything with that. I can't do cookie-based affinity. Um, I can't do SSL offload. That would be something like app gateway. Uh, Azure app gateway is a layer seven, i.e. understands the application. So we have a layer four in this model. And I, again, I'm saying that please do not throw sausage pizza away. Uh, when I was 18 and I was learning it, it was actually involving Pamela Anderson was the, the thing we used to remember it, but not gonna go into that. Please do not throw sausage pizza away. Better thing to do today. So this is layer four. So I understand TCP, I understand UDP. Now I have a front end IP. So that's what this traffic is going to. This can be an internal IP, or it can be external, i.e. a public IP. A load balancer in Azure is internal or external. I, cannot, I can have multiple front end configurations, but they're all of the same type. So my load balancer is an internal load balancer or an external load balancer. I cannot mix these up. So that's kind of an important point from the start. So I have a front end configuration and then I essentially have this kind of back end pool. Now, traditionally the back end pool was always kind of the NICs. So you would have a NIC IP configuration and I would add the NICs into the backend pool. Now we can actually do IP address directly now as well. So one of the things I can actually add is just IP addresses. This would be kind of useful is, well, if I use the NIC, it's a configuration at the VM or the VM scale set to add it into the pool. If I do IP address, I could kind of pre-allocate a bunch of IPs into the pool and then create the resources later on. I could use it for something like, um, Azure Container Instances. I can't use it for things like a private endpoint today. 
But the point is I have this back-end pool. And traditionally we think about VMs and virtual machine scale sets. Then I have a load balancer. Again, it's internal or it's external. And then what this is going to do is kind of distribute the traffic to those virtual machines, those resources that are part of the backend pool. Now to enable all these distributions, let me change the color for a second, we have rules. Now there are different types of rules. There were things like NAT rules. So a NAT rule is a direct mapping one-to-one -one saying, hey, this IP and port always goes to this IP and port of this particular virtual machine. It's not distributing it out. Then I actually have things like load balancing rules, and that's what we're really gonna focus on. This is where I'm actually gonna distribute the incoming traffic between that backend port. But there are also things like HA port rules, and then there are outbound rules. And I'm gonna kind of cover uh, those later on. So we have these rules. And the other thing we do actually have going on here is health probes. Because I need to make sure that these possible backend pool members are actually responding. So I can actually create health probes to say, hey, um, are you there? Uh, are, are you awake? Uh, are you responding to things? And when I actually go ahead, if I look at a load balancer, for example, we can see, well, firstly, I can see that is inbound NAT rules. And an inbound NAT rule would let me, as I kind of mentioned, do a direct mapping between a particular front end IP, a particular service. You can see all the different services I can support there. And then a particular port on the back end and a particular VM. So it's not distributing it, it's a mapping kind of one to one. But then we have these health probes. So here I've got a health probe. And I can see, hey, what I'm actually doing is I'm using TCP or I could do HTTP or HTTPS. This particular port, so that's the port on the back ends it's gonna try and communicate with. Hey, I'm gonna check every five seconds. And if I get two kind of missed, two failed responses, I'm gonna consider you unhealthy. I'm gonna stop sending traffic to you. So this health probe is really kind of super important when I think about, I don't want to send traffic to something that is not working anymore. So the whole point of the health probe is, hey, I can check it. So when I have these various rules, often I'll involve a health probe to go and check to say, hey, yeah, I want to do this mapping, say stuff comes in on a front end IP, I want to send it to this back end particular pool, but use the health probe to make sure I'm only sending to ones that are actually responding. So it's kind of an important thing. Now, when I talk about the back end pool, I kind of talk about the fact that, well, I have this virtual machine or I have an IP. A particular VM, be it a virtual machine or part of a virtual machine scale set or even an IP address, can only be a member of one back end pool. Well, I can be a member of one internal back end pool and one external back end pool. Does that make sense? So I could have a particular VM, could be part of a pool that's attached to an internal load balancer, and that same VM could also be part of a back end pool that's used by an internal. So one internal, one external. And again, I kind of see that in my configuration. This is an external load balancer. I have a back end pool. And if I was to look at it, I have two VMs that are part of a VM scale set. I could not add either of these to another back end pool on another external load balancer. I cannot do that. But I also have an internal load balancer, and we see the same two VMs, part of that VM scale set, are a member of that pool as well. So any particular VM can be a member of one internal backend pool and one external backend pool. So that's kind of a, a key rule to remember when I think about, hey, I, I have these capabilities, I want to do this mapping. Now I can use the backend pool in multiple rules. It's just that particular definition is how we do that. Additionally, 
there's actually two types of skew for the outer low balancer. So yes, I create the outer low balancer as internal or external, i.e. it's an internal IP address or an external IP address. But there is also this concept of the skew. Previously, we just had basic low balancer. And with a basic, it supports up to kind of 300 instances on that back end. But all 300 have to be in the same availability set. Remember, an availability set is within a particular data center spread over three fault domains. So I cannot span availability sets. I can only point to one availability set. So I can have one essentially back end pool with a basic load balancer. The standard load balancer, I can have actually up to a thousand instances and they can be across anything within a virtual network. So I cannot span virtual networks, I cannot span regions, because a VNet cannot span regions, but they could be across different virtual networks. Sorry, they, they could be across uh, different availability sets, it doesn't matter. So up to a thousand instances on, in a backend pool, I can have multiple backend pools. Same wall applies though, a single VM can't be in more than one pool, but they could be spread over different availability sets. Um, I can do things like spread over availability zones for additional resiliency. I can do health probing on TCP, HTTP, and HTTPS with the standard load balancer. And there's, there's limitations. You can kind of go through and see all the differences between them. But fundamentally, standard load balancer is what I'm going to generally use for production. And there are things we're going to talk about later on, like HA ports and outbound flows. So really, I can only control with the standard load balancer. Basic, um, it's kind of open by default. It's this kind of implicit outbound flow that I really have no control over. So we're not kind of super keen on that. But go and take a look at this article and you can really kind of get an idea of, hey, here's the differences. It talks about, hey, virtual machines in a single availability set or VM scale set for basic. Whereas, hey, my standard, hey, any VM, or scale set in a single virtual network. So it is giving me kind of a lot more flexibility there. So if I was to expand on this picture, I can say with well, this back end pool, remember if it's basic, I can just have one in a particular availability set. If it's standard, I can have multiple uh, in one VNet. So I, I cannot span VNets with that low balancer. Okay, so this load balancing rule thing, what exactly is this doing? So the point of low balancing rule is I say, hey, for this front end IP address, for a particular port, particular protocol, I want you to distribute to this particular back end port. Now, these could be listening on a different port. This could be listening, for example, on port 80, the back ends are doing 8080 or something else. I have that flexibility. But it has to be able to distribute that traffic. So how does it distribute the traffic? And if I think about, well, what information do we have? We have kind of these five tuples. I can think about, I have a source port. I have a destination port. I have a protocol. I have a source IP and a destination IP address. Now the protocol is always going to be, again, TCP or UDP. They're the only two protocols that support it. This is why I can't ping a load balancer. There's other reasons as well, but ICMP, which kind of sits next to IP, that layer three, is not supported here. The Azure load balancer can only pass through stuff, cannot pass through ICMP. So you cannot ping an Azure load balancer. It will just fail, it gets dropped. So ordinarily the default is five tuples. So when the packet comes in, the hashing algorithm looks at the source, port and IP, destination port and IP and the protocol, generates a hash value, and that says, well, which backend should it go to? So when the next packet comes in with those same values, it will always send it to the same backend member, because I want a certain stickiness. And that stickiness means, hey, um, I don't want to just randomly go to a different box every time. Maybe there's some kind of ongoing session that I need to maintain. There's some data on this box that I need to have access to 
for the continued communication from the same source port and IP address. So we have these two pools that are used to generate this kind of hash, and that hash is stored, and I'll always go to the same backend member. Now that's the default, that kind of five tuple. But I can change that. I could actually say, well, do you know what? I only care about the protocol and the IP addresses. I, I don't care if the ports are different. So this is kind of three tuple. So now, even if the ports change that I'm coming from or going to, I'll go to the same backend member, it's stickier. Or I can even do two tuple. So now even the protocol can change. I could jump between TCP and UDP. As long as the source IP is the same and the destination IP is the same, which it will be, it's the front end IP of the load balancer, that's not going to change. It will always go to the same back end member, if it's healthy. If the health probe is reporting it's not reporting anymore, well, it, it will go to someone else. It will have to. So I can do this configuration of how sticky I want to make sure I still go to the same backend member. So if we actually go and look at this, if I was to jump back and we look at our load balancing rules, this is what we really care about. I can see here, well, yes, I have kind of an IP, so we do have IPv6 as well. I have a front end IP address, so I listen on a particular IP address. I have a particular protocol, TCP or UDP. Then I can do things like, well, what is the back end port? So what is the actual port that I'm going to uh, send things to? Notice I could also have the regular port, that's the port on the front end. Then I have what pool am I sending these responses to? So the back end pool. What health probe am I using? So how do I check if it's healthy? And then we actually have kind of this session persistence. And this is what I'm talking about. So by default, we say none. That's five tuple. That's kind of just the default. But notice I can also change it to kind of just the client IP. So two tuple or client IP and protocol. So that kind of three tuple. So this is how I can kind of track, hey, I, I want to change this and how sticky I want those particular sessions to actually be. So as part of that load balancing rule, I can configure all of the things on how it's actually going to send that traffic. So you can go and kind of look at one of these rules, gives you a good idea of how we're actually going to distribute the traffic. Now this tuple is actually very important. Because if you think about it, um, if I had all of my traffic coming from the same IP and the same source port on the same protocol, well, I'm probably always sending to the same front end IP. I'm going to have to, as low balancer, or maybe the same port. When I run this hashing algorithm, well, it's always going to result in the same hash. So it's not going to distribute very well. So even though I might have 10 back end members, if all of the traffic comes from one source port and one source IP, it's going to go to one backend member. So when I start to architect my solutions, if I have, well, this is internal, and I just have some middle process or some front end always going to just that middle tier, and it's single threaded, it's not going to get a very good distribution. I really want to try and make sure that, hey, I am using a range of kind of source ports, so I, I can kind of distribute, I may, I did it maybe come from different IP addresses. I wanna make sure I get a good spread, so the traffic when it comes in and goes through that hash algorithm, is not gonna end up with the same hash value and goes to one backend member. I wanna try and make sure there's enough variation, especially in kind of those source ports that's coming in, ideally there's source IPs as well, that will generate unique hash values so I'm going to get a good spread over all of my backend members. So it's just something to consider in my architecture. Okay, so we understand the idea of the load balancing rule. We understand the load balancer here. I've got front end IP and it's internal or external. Um, I have rules that map the backend pools. And again, I can have multiple front end IPs, multiple rules, different health probes. So I can host multiple sets of configurations on a single load balancer. But what is this? actually look like? How's this actually working? So logically, remember, we have the load balancer, 
with its front end IP, say its front end IP1. And we have the traffic coming in. And then we have things on the back end. We have these, the back end pool, and it says IP4, IP5, IP6. I'm being lazy. It might be 10.1.0.4, 10.1.0.5, etc. But essentially, its job is to distribute that traffic, and it does that through that hashing algorithm. So, how does it actually do that? So, from an implementation perspective, I can really think about well, at the edge of the region, there are these regional network gateways. So there's some kind of data center router, some main router here. And when the traffic's actually coming in, it, it, it's hitting that router, if it's coming in from the internet. Now, if it's internal, there's a slightly different flow, but most of it's the same. And I will talk about that in a second. So we have this router, and that's coming in. And what I can think about, remember, is, okay, we've got the router. Where does that traffic go next? So what actually happens is, we have muxes, multiplexes. There's a whole bunch of these muxes. And these muxes kind of form a ring. They're not physical appliances. This is software-defined networking. These are software components. There is no physical load balancer. There are things that are part of a load balancing solution. Now, remember that front end IP over there? That front end IP address is actually hosted on all of the muxes in that ring. So they're all offering front end IP1. And it's actually kind of using BGP Anycast within the region to say, hey, I've got front end IP1. And so now the router has multiple different paths to get to front end IP1. And what it's actually going to do is something called equal cost multipath, so it's ECMP. All that means is when something comes into it and it says, hey, I want to go to front end IP1, it will equally distribute that traffic to front end IP1 between the muxes in that mux ring. So these muxes, are all offering front end IP1. They're constantly talking, so if one failed, it, the router would find out about that and it would stop sending it the traffic. Okay, so that's what gets the traffic. Now remember, we have our kind of back end pool members. So we have kind of IP4, we have IP5, uh, we have IP6. Now, they're in Azure, it's Infrastructure as a service, they're virtual machines, even if it's virtual machine scale sets, it's still virtual machines. They're hosted on physical boxes. I mean, there's, there's a box, there's a physical host that is running that virtual machine. On those physical boxes, I mean, it, it, it's Hyper-V. There's a virtual switch, and as part of the virtual switch, there's also something called the virtual filtering platform. And the virtual filtering platform is where a lot of really cool, powerful stuff happens, like network security groups. They're enforced uh, through that virtual filtering platform. So what's happening is the traffic comes into front end IP1. The MUX is what kind of runs that hashing algorithm. So if it's the first packet of a new session, it's never seen this particular hash before, works out the hash, and then it picks, based on the load balancing, it picks a possible target. When the second packet comes in and runs the hash algorithm, it will see, oh, I've already got, I've seen this before. Um, hash, whatever it is, always goes to backend member IP6. Now at this point, the packet has come in, the source is that internet-based IP and port, the destination was whatever that front end IP was, front end IP1, or whatever the port is listening, 80 or 443. At this point, the muxes have to kind of encapsulate it temporarily so it can send it to that virtual switch. The traffic now continues from whichever mux got it, it sends it to the virtual switch, which sends it to the virtual filtering platform, the VFP. Now the virtual filtering platform now says, well, the destination was front end IP1. And he has no clue. 
this back end pull member has no clue what that is. So it's going to rewrite the destination to be IP6. So now it can treat it like a regular packet. It sends the response. When it gets back to here, it does the rewrite again. It changes the destination. Well, in this case, actually, sorry, not the destination, it would be the source, because now it's going outbound, it's the response. It changes the source from IP6 to front end IP. So it looks like it's coming from the load balancer. Now this is where it's cool. You would think we would now send it to the MUX that would send it to the router that would send it to the internet. Why? What does the MUX do? The MUX's only job is to receive the data to run the hashing algorithm to work out which backend pool member should it go to. What value would it add to send it back via the MUX? No. So it doesn't. The virtual filtering platform, the VFP, has already done the rewrite of the source to make it look like it's coming from the front end IP. So now it just sends it back out to the internet. It doesn't touch the MUX. I'm really optimizing. So this MUX pattern is phenomenal. There's multiple instances, there's no hardware, it scales great, massive capacity. And we're really optimizing it because the return doesn't even touch the MUX. The MUX doesn't have to work at all for the return traffic. It just kind of goes straight out. And so that's what it's doing. That's actually the, the physical kind of implementation of what this does. The VFP does a lot of that kind of rewrite capability to optimize what is happening in the environment. So again, hopefully this really helps emphasize the reason I can't ping the load balancer is what would I ping? All the MUX does is forward stuff through. If I sent an ICMP packet to a MUX, it'd be like, I don't know what to do with this. It's just going to drop it. Now, the fact that it doesn't send via the MUX, um, you'll actually hear this called DSR, direct server return. And that's what Azure Load Balancer always does. Internal, external, standard, basic. It always does this. It always bypasses the MUX on that return. Now, there is something a little bit different if it's internal traffic. And you could kind of imagine just for a second, I had another IP address over here. And now this was an internal front end, just for example. So it would still have to go and talk to kind of the MUX initially. Hey, I, I, I want to go and talk to this front end IP. Now we're pretending this front end IP is an internal load balancer. And once again, the MUX would do the hash and it would kind of redirect it to a certain switch and it would now get the response back directly. So that's kind of that first packet. So that behaves the same. But now there's actually a flow table. So this was all going through kind of, again, the virtual switch and the VFP. This has this kind of flow table to track um, some of this hashing and what's going on. When it wants to send another packet, once it hits the VFP, the VFP knows, I know this flow already. I already spoke to the MUX before. The MUX told me, hey, this particular flow, I go to this host who will then send it to this backend member. So packet two, when it goes out, doesn't bother hitting the MUX. And this packet one would have gone by the VFP. It just now talks directly. So for an internal load balancer, the MUX is used for the first packet, then doesn't need to really get used anymore. So there's an even bigger optimization that can happen there. So it really kind of helps all that go on. Okay, so that's what I think about regular load balancing, the load balancing rule. But I also mentioned, if we go back up here, so I've kind of talked about the NAT and the load balancing rule. I talked about this HA port thing. Now the HA port thing is only for a standard internal load balancer. So this HA port is standard internal only. And it's designed around the fact, if we look at a regular load balancing rule, here we can see the regular load balancing rule is all based around, hey, look, I have to have this particular port and then sending it to a particular backend port and it's a particular protocol. It has to do those things. But if I'm, let's say, a network virtual appliance, for example, that's really not ideal. I want to cover every port and I want to do TCP and UDP. And I want to make sure maybe I've got a symmetric flow. I want to make sure that, hey, 
Um, search traffic coming in, going to a target when the response, I, I always handle it to the same particular appliance behind this load balancer. And so for an internal load balancer, we're actually going to look at an internal one, and I look at a load balancing rule, you can actually see I have this HA ports option that I do not have on an external load balancer. If I check that, watch what happens. Notice we've got the TCP protocol, the port, the back end port. It vanishes. When I do HA ports, this is now doing it for all ports, it's doing it for TCP and UDP. So this is really, really useful if I had network virtual appliances and I just want them to get everything. I don't want to have to worry about the protocol or the ports. It would just send all of the flow. It basically will distribute everything based on the flow. So I'm going to get that symmetric routing, which is what I need for a lot of things. So we've got this HA ports option, removes the protocol port, and will basically just send everything. Now, while I'm looking at this screen, I did want to point out this other thing, this floating IP. Now, it does bracket direct server return. Um, Azure is always direct server return. Floating IP, when I enable this, actually does something else as well. So ordinarily, if I am one of these kind of backend pool members, remember what I, I kind of drew here was the packet got rewritten with the destination's IP address. So if I think about if I am that particular virtual machine and my IP is IP6, remember, and it was behind the load balancer which had front end IP1. Ordinarily, the, the traffic, the packet I see, because the virtual filtering platform rewrites the destination, what I see as the destination is my IP and the port I'm listening on. So maybe I'm listening on 8080, whereas maybe the front end is 80. So I would see that. This is the normal behavior. If I turn on floating IP, what it essentially does is what the VM now sees as the destination is the front end IP and the front end port. So it doesn't get rewritten, which means the VM now has to handle, oh, it thinks it has that IP. It's used by SQL Server, and you have like a loopback address which fakes the front end IP, um, Azure Kubernetes service. The worker nodes actually via that service component, it, it kind of has that as well. So I turn on floating IP. So what the, the VM, the processing size seeds as the destination is the front end IP. So that's what floating IP does. It always does direct server return. I don't like the fact that it's got bracket direct server return. Azure load balancer always does direct server return. There's kind of this second part, which is about the IP address. So when I turn on floating IP, what it's really saying is what the workload inside the backend pool will see is the destination is the IP and pool of the front end config of the load balancer. If I don't have floating IP turned on, then what it will see as a destination is its own IP and the port it's listening on. So it's just kind of an important point. That's what floating IP does. Okay, so we've covered load balancing rules, HA ports. What about outbound? So for outbound, it's a fairly similar story. So I can think about, once again, I've, I've got these members of my backend pool, IP4, 5, and 6. There's, once again, my kind of load balancer. It has a front end IP. And let's assume it's a public for the time being. Let's assume it's a public IP address. Now, remember, one of the challenges we have is if these are private, these are all private IPs, they don't work on the internet. So I have to do a network address translation. So how does that work with a load balancer? Well, we have to do kind of this source network address translation. And it's actually even more than that. We need to do a port address source SNAP. 
because I only have one public IP, okay? So let's even forget about that for a second. I can think about, I have one public IP. And the way ordinarily things work is if I have an IP address and I'm talking to some outbound, I use a unique pulp as the source for every different thing I go and talk to. So when the response comes back to that particular pool, I know, hey, I'll, this was being used by this process. So I can think about if I had a bunch of kind of private IPs now, private IP1, um, private IP2, private IP3, and they're all gonna talk via the same public IP. Well, this might try and send out a packet as the source to say, hey, okay, the source in my case is source IP1 port 4000. So it goes to the public IP. Well, the public IP can't just send it out as its IP, it has to replace it. So it has to say, okay, well, I've got this coming in from this particular IP address. I have to map it to one of the ports it has. Now, the port is a 16 bit value, so it's like 65,000 um, ports are available. So what it has to do is it has to pick one of those ports. We call them an ephemeral port, and it picks one. So it might say, hey, port one. So port one, I'm gonna use you for IP1 4000. So it sends the packet out as source its IP, um, port one. Now, private IP2 sends out a packet. Well, that might get port number two. So now that's IP2 and it was doing it from 3000, etc. So you can see it uses those ports up. Now if I have lots of private IPs on the back end doing lots of connections, sure, uh, 65,500, sounds like a lot of ports. Um, but you actually start to run out. The more back end members I have, you run out. If you do a netstat-an on your machine, you'll kind of see some of the ports you're using right now. There's a lot of them. So this is actually, this is, this is a, a challenging thing to solve. But this is exactly what the load balancer kind of has to do, or does it? So this is the whole idea of this translation. Right now, the load balancer's primary job is about stuff coming in. So I have this inbound flow. And I have this front end IP and it's designed to kind of send things to the possible back ends. Now, if it is a basic load balancer, even if it's an internal load balancer, there's kind of this pseudo public IP used behind the scenes that you have no control over. It's kind of implicit that it will use and it will allocate to enable this outbound flow. Now, I have no control over that IP. It could change at any time. And I, it's just one. I could absolutely have a port exhaustion. If I have a big back end port, I think was it 300 members I could have? Well, 64,000 is actually the number of ports it can actually use. There's 64,000 ports. It's about over 300. It's really not that many. So with a basic, yes, if it's an internal load balancer, it will still do this kind of dynamic, implicit, not using a public IP that we can't see or control, it can change at any time, but it, it will work. But we have no control, it's really not an ideal thing. So for the standard load balancer, they kind of fix that. For the standard load balancer, if I have a, a public load balancer, then yes, it can go out through that IP address, but it's actually not recommended. The recommendation would be, well, we'd actually have a separate IP address for the outbound, or even better, a prefix for the outbound. Because then I could have multiple IP addresses and even regular outbound rule, I can say multiple IP addresses. So if I start to run out of ports, well, I can use the next IP and it gives me those 64,000 ports again. And then the next IP address, so I can scale much better. But let's take a step back from that. I kind of drew these, these virtual machines. Now you'll remember, from before, we had the muxes. So we had these muxes kind of what actually got the traffic. So how did this work for an outbound flow? So remember, we still have the virtual filtering platform. 
So this wants to get out to the internet. Well, it's actually the virtual filtering platform does the work. So hey, I want to send an outbound. The virtual filtering platform knows kind of the public IP of the load balancer. It does the rewrite as the source. It allocates an ephemeral port and it sends it out. Okay. It did the rewrite to the front end IP because it knows about the configuration it's populated. When the response comes in, it's going to hit the load balancer. The load balancer is going to send it to a particular MUX. The MUX is not aware of this flow. The MUX has zero clue that this used a certain port. How does it know to send it to this? So the way this actually works is when I have this load balancer in the, the mix, there's those 64,000 ports. It actually divides them up. Now, this is kind of the implicit, the dynamic where I have no control. It will basically just split them up equally over the number of backends. So it might say, hey, um, first backend member, you get ports 1 to 1,024. You get 1,025 to 2,048. You get 2,049 to 3072, etc. And we can actually see that. If we go and look at the documentation, it actually goes through and it shows us there's a pool, there's a table somewhere. So you want to find it quickly. Um, there we go. If I have between 1 and 50 backend members, it gives 1,024 ports per IP configuration per backend member. But you notice the more backend members I have, well, there's less ports out of 64,000. All the way down to if I had 1,000 members, I get 32 ports per backend member. I mean, you're going to run out. It will not work at that point. So the ports will get exhausted, outbound connections will fail, and I'm having a bad day. So the whole point here is that they're allocated so the MUX knows, hey, these particular backend members use these ports. Hey, this came in on port 50, which means it goes to that particular backend member. So that's kind of how it works from the load balancer. But what standard gives me is much more control. So when we talk about the rules, it's that process that used, but I have outbound rules. Now what outbound rules let me do is I have complete control over this now. So if I go and look at an external, remember it has to be external, if it's standard, there's no implicit. So with standard, if I have an internal load balancer, the backend pools can't get to the internet. There, there is no path. I would either have to give them a public IP address directly per VM, which is ugly, or I could use NAT gateway. NAT gateway I could apply at the subnet level, that would give it outbound. But if I want to use the load balancer, and I had an internal load balancer, I would have to add an external load balancer with a public IP address or better a prefix, and then connect those backend pool members to that load balancer. Remember, a VM can be a member of one backend pool that's internal, one backend pool that's external. So I can still have the idea that, hey, they're behind an internal load balancer, but hey, I want them to have outbound connectivity, so I create an external load balancer. I don't have any load balancing rules coming in. I only use it for outbound, but I have complete control. So on my external load balancer, I can create outbound rules, and I have complete control of this. So if we look at the rule, I can select, and I can have multiple rules. Well, I select what front end IP, so I can have multiple IPs. So again, think about that. That port exhaustion, I have 64,000 ports per IP. If I give an outbound rule four IPs, well, now I've got 64 times four ports. I can even use an IP prefix. If I don't create new, well, I can use an IP prefix. I might have a slash 28. Now I have a whole bunch of IP addresses. So as it exhausts all the ports from a certain IP from the prefix, it goes and uses the next IP from the prefix. So it's going to make sure I don't run out. So this is actually a phenomenal option. Then I can also, I have the outbound, I can pick, well, okay, well, who's using this outbound? So I have this particular backend pool is using it. And then I have control of the pool allocation. 
So I have the option to use the default. That's that table that I just showed you where, hey, look, um, there's a pool size of 50, I get 1,020 for each. That's totally risky. And it even warns you of this. Azure may drop existing connections when you scale out. Because if I went from 50 to 51, well, what have I done? I've now said, well, I only have 512 ports. It has to reallocate all the ports. So if I was kind of bad luck, it's gonna to have to drop all the connections so we can reallocate the ports. So really don't like that. I wanna kind of do a static explicit rule, but it actually gives me more flexibility. So I can say, hey, no, I wanna manually choose it. I wanna say, I want this many ports per instance, or I know the maximum number of backend pool members I'm ever gonna have. So I can say, hey, look, I know I'm never gonna have more than let's say 10. And notice what it's done, 64,000 divided by 10. Hey, each instance can have 6,400 ports. Remember, that's per front end IP this rule is using. If I had a prefix and it had eight usable IPs, for example, well then it's eight times 6,400 um, ports per backend member. So I have a lot of kind of capabilities there. Or I could say, do you know what? I know how many ports I need. I need, let's just say, uh, I need 1,000 ports. Well, then you can have up to 64 backend pool members. And again, I can have lots of rules. I can have a rule for TCP, a rule for UDP. I can control the reset behavior. I can control the ports. And again, the best practice would be use a prefix. Don't use an IP, use a prefix for the outbound. And again, the best practice here would very much be, hey, look, uh, I'm using the standard load balancer. When I think about my configuration, if it's a public, I've got the wrong color. If, if it's a public load balancer, even though I have kind of a front end IP for the inbound, which goes to all the back end pool members, I actually have an IP prefix for the outbound. So I'm separating, I don't use the same IP, so I use a separate, I have an IP for the inbound. Inbound cannot use a prefix, inbound is one IP. So I have an IP for the inbound, so this is kind of the load balancing rules. Then I use a prefix for the outbound rules. So how I'm doing that source now. I'm separating those two things. So this is if it was kind of an external load balancer. If it was an internal load balancer, well then I'd have the internal load balancer with the internal IP and a separate outbound, but I'd have kind of the same backend pool members um, for both the separate load balancers. So that's it. Um, covered a lot, obviously. There's a, there's a lot to the load balancer. Really the key point though, is can you follow those rules? I really would say think about standard. I would not ignore the outbound flow. Remember to really think about, okay, I want to do that explicit. What is the outbound connectivity? Um, how many backend members do I have? It is secure by default. So with basic, again, we don't really want to use basic for production. With basic, yes, it does kind of that um, implicit, Dynamics map for public IP, I can't see or control, it's going to change. With standard, it's locked down. I have to go and add an external IP, or if it's an internal load balancer, I have a separate external load balancer, and I go and create the rules. Without the rules, it won't do any outbound. I have to add the rules to control that. So I hope this was useful. I know a lot of detail. If it was, please like, comment, subscribe, please share. Uh, until next video, take care.